Hello and welcome back to AJS 101 Introduction to Criminal Justice Lesson 3 and now Part 3. Let's talk about defenses. A defense is an argument offered by a defendant as to why he or she should not be held liable for a crime. And there are four categories of defenses. Alibis, justifications, excuses, and procedural defenses. Let's first talk about the alibi defense. Now, an alibi defense asserts that the defendant didn't do it. They assert that he or she was not there or if there, didn't do it. So the alibi defense is a pure claim of innocence. Now let's move on to a second group of defenses, and these we call justification defenses. Now a justification defense, the justification defenses concede that the defendant committed the criminal act, but assert that it was to avoid a greater harm and was therefore the better thing to do. The justification defenses are self-defense, defense of others, defense of home and or property, necessity, consent, and resisting an unlawful arrest. The self-defense and defense of others defenses. They assert that the criminal act taken was necessary to protect oneself, another, or one's property against an unlawful a threat or attack or theft by another. A person can use the self-defense defense whenever they have a reasonable belief in the immediate necessity to use physical force or deadly physical force against the use or threatened use of unlawful physical force or deadly physical force. Let me repeat that. You can use the self-defense defense when you have a reasonable belief in the immediate necessity to use physical force or deadly physical force against the use or threatened use of unlawful physical force or deadly physical force against you. Note that the force must, the force used must be proportional to the force threatened. And in some instances, the person must retreat before using deadly physical force. Also note that the alter ego rule asserts that a person can only defend a third party to the extent that he or she reasonably believes the third party could defend himself or herself. Now, I'd like to go into some detail uh, about the elements of this self-defense defense. Uh, the first part of it is you have to have a reasonable belief. Uh, an important word here is belief. The law is not concerned with the actuality of the situation. Uh, in other words, if a person points a inoperable gun or a model gun at somebody and says, I'm going to kill you, and the gun looks real, and the person has no reason to believe that the person will not kill them, and the person being threatened pulls out his gun and shoots and kills the, the aggressor, the fact that the aggressor's gun could not have done anything because it was not a real gun or it was inoperable is not relevant to the self-defense defense. It's what you believe is going on, not what actually is going on. Because if the actuality were required, then if somebody had a, an operable gun and pointed it at a cop to, to kill them and the cop defended him or herself, the cop would go to jail because the cop didn't know the gun was inoperable. So it's not what's going on. It's what the belief is. But the belief must be a reasonable belief. Uh, it, it can't be a paranoid belief. So this is a um, objective criteria. It's not whether the person who used force sincerely believes that it was reasonable, it's would society believe it was reasonable. And the judges of that would be a jury. A jury of your peers would decide that based on the facts that were known to you, whether or not your belief was reasonable or not. 
Okay, the next element is in the immediate necessity. Well, necessity is obviously the, the use of force has to be necessary to, to defend yourself. Uh, but it's important that this necessity must be immediate. The threat to you of physical force or a deadly physical force must be for the current occasion and not for some time in the future. If you got into an altercation with somebody and they yelled at you, I'm going home to get my gun to kill you, you couldn't shoot them then because there's no immediate threat. So the threat has to be uh, immediately present. Now, you don't have to wait for somebody to actually connect with your nose with a punch. You know, when the person starts to draw back, that's immediate enough uh, for the law. So a reasonable belief in the immediate necessity to use physical force or deadly physical force against the use or threatened use of unlawful physical force or deadly physical force. Now, notice that I have physical force and then deadly physical force. Uh, this is important because there's proportionality in the law. If you're being threatened with physical force, you can only respond with physical force. You can respond with overpowering physical force, but you cannot elevate to deadly physical force when you're only being threatened with physical force. Now, this brings up the issue of what's the difference. Physical force is force based on the way it's used or threatened to be used is readily capable of causing physical injury. Deadly physical force is physical force based on the way it's used or threatened to be used, which is readily capable of causing serious physical injury. Uh, physical injury uh, is, you know, bruises, cuts, scratches, right, stuff like that, substantial pain. Serious physical injury is injury which can kill you, injury which can cause permanent scarring. It's uh, injury which causes the loss of a body function, like your eye gets poked out, or long-term impairment of a body function, like a broken arm or leg. So, proportionality. Uh, and again, against the use or threatened use, that means that the person doesn't have to actually be swinging the punch. If you think the punch is imminent, it's about to come, you can do a preemptive uh, attack because they're threatening you, but it's got to be an immediate situation. And, of course, the force they're using against you has to be unlawful force. If a police officer is using lawful force to arrest you, you cannot do self-defense. It's only when somebody is using unlawful force that you can defend yourself. And, again, has to be proportional. I discussed that. And in some cases, the person must retreat before using deadly physical force. In some states, you must always retreat before using deadly physical force if you, if you can safely do so. And in those states, the only exceptions are is if you're in your home or place of business or if you're a police officer uh, enforcing the law. We don't expect cops to run from danger. We expect cops to run to danger. In Arizona, however, and in some other states like Florida, uh, we have stand your ground laws. And that means that no matter where you are, uh, you can stand your ground. You don't have to retreat. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't retreat. Personally, if I was being threatened with deadly force as a citizen, as a civilian, and I could safely retreat, I would do that to avoid myself possibly being injured or killed and all the legal issues that come about if you wind up shooting and killing somebody. But technically, you don't have to run away in Arizona if you're the, the good person uh, and the other person's the illegal aggressor against you. It's called stand your ground. And it's based on the fact that... Uh, you know, you might get injured running away, turning your back uh, could, could put you in, in, in more mortal danger. Uh, okay, and we already went over the alter ego rule. Uh, and that's an important rule, but let me talk about that a little bit too. Uh, you have to believe the person, if you intervene and you're using physical force or deadly force to defend somebody else, you have to believe that that person would be justified in using deadly or it, for physical force or deadly physical force to defend themselves. Uh, and that's not always easy to do if you stumble on a situation and don't know all the facts. You know, you, you turn around the corner and there's somebody on top of somebody else striking them and the person uh, on the ground is saying, help me, help me, help me. Uh, and you go over and you kick the person on top off only to discover that the person on top is a police officer affecting a lawful arrest. Well, now he has two prisoners, uh, the one he's, he's attempting to arrest and you. So... Make sure you have the facts straight because uh, third-party cases can be rather perilous and confusing. Let's talk about defense of home and defense of property. 
The law allows people to use necessary force, short of deadly force, to defend property against theft or destruction. But the use of deadly force solely to protect property is not allowed because in our society, we value life over property. Necessity. The necessity defense claims that it was all right to commit an illegal act because it was necessary to do so to avoid a greater harm. But murder and the infliction of serious physical injury is not justified under the necessity defense because here, uh, you can't kill somebody to prevent somebody from damaging property or something like that. Uh, clearly, the uh, you, you use force to prevent a greater evil, not an equal or lesser evil. So since murder and serious physical injury are great evils, uh, you can't uh, uh, use them to, to defend yourself against a lesser evil like theft, uh, theft of property. Um, I actually used the necessity defense when I was uh, younger and I was in the National Guard. Uh, I was in the National Guard, I was in the motor pool, and myself and uh, another spec four, uh, we were driving a wrecker uh, upstate New York because we were going for an overnight bivouac or you know, camping. So we, uh, my friend who was driving made a wrong turn. And he woke me up and said, I have no idea where I am. I'm on this deserted road. And I was like, whoa. I said, well, let's turn around and go back the other way. So he goes to make a U-turn with this massive, like, you know, 30-foot long truck, 40-foot long truck. And uh, in the middle of the U-turn, when the truck is now blocking both lanes, the drive shaft rumbles and collapses. And we are now disabled on a deserted, unlit road in the middle of the countryside. Um, and of course, this was a military truck, so it didn't have any lights or, or, or flashes on it because you're supposed to be, you know, like jungle fighting subdued. Uh, I looked out the window and I saw a dim light in the distance and said, uh oh, a car is coming and that car will not see us and there's going to be a big accident. So we both ran out of the truck. We ran down the road trying to flag down the car, but the driver didn't see us and he smashed into the wrecker causing virtually no damage to this massive tow truck, uh, but seriously injuring himself. Uh, you know, he was pretty badly hurt. Uh, we were amazingly, and we were part of a signal company, right? But guess what we did not have in our truck? Yes, we didn't have a radio, so we couldn't radio for help. I looked around and I saw a building on top of a nearby hill. I ran up. It was a commercial business that was closed. But inside the window, I observed the telephone, and, but, the, but the, it, the window was locked and the door was locked. So I took a rock and I broke the glass. I reached in and I used the phone to call the police and an ambulance. Now, I committed a criminal act. I intentionally damaged the property of another, which is criminal mischief. But I wasn't even arrested because this was a clear case of the necessity defense. I committed a minor crime, breaking a window, to, create, to prevent a greater harm, the guy in the accident bleeding to death. So that's an example of the necessity defense. Uh, let's move on. Let's talk about the consent defense. The consent defense asserts that the victim consented to the illegal act performed upon him or her. The most common examples are uh, the rough sex defense, where, where two people agreed to engage in sadomasochism Kistic sex, and one might be injured in, in the process, but both voluntarily did this. Uh, the other is professional boxing. In professional boxing, two people try to inflict fairly serious injury. They try to give concussions to each other and knock them out. But because they're both consenting and because they're in an event licensed by the state, there's no crime if one injures or even kills the other. Uh, in fact, don't try this like with Fight Club, you know, you know, in some basement on your own, because even though in those situations both parties consent, it is not a sanctioned state licensed event where there are doctors handy and people have physicals. So it, it won't work for Fight Club. Let's move on to resisting unlawful arrests. Generally, a person cannot use force to resist even an unlawful arrest unless the police officer uses unlawful force to make the arrest. So, even if you're being arrested on trumped up charges, if the officer is not using excessive force to make the arrest, you cannot use physical force to resist the arrest. 
And our society believes that the place to decide the legality of the arrest, the arrest is not on the street, but in a courtroom. So you must submit to the arrest uh, and tell it to the judge. Uh, and even then, the use of force must be reasonable and proportional. But it is generally not a good idea to resist arrest by a police officer. Generally, many more police officers come in response to a call for help, and the person resisting uh, gets injured. Let's talk about excuse defenses. Now, excuse defenses assert that the defendant committed the criminal act, but that he or she should not be held criminally liable because of some personal shortcoming or mitigating circumstance. The excuse defenses are duress, age, mistake, involuntary intoxication, unconsciousness, provocation, insanity, and diminished capacity. We'll talk about duress first. The duress defense asserts that the person committed the Ill Ill illegal act under threat that if they did not do so, some greater harm would come to them or a third party. Uh, let me give you the classical example. You are a bank manager. You come home from work. You open the door, and there is your wife and children tied up in the living room with two gunmen pointing guns at them and you. The gunmen say, if you don't go back to your bank, unlock the door, go into the vault, and put all the money in the vault in a bag and come back here, we will kill your family. This is a situation where the threat killing your family is greater than the crime that you're going to be committing, which is grand larceny. And if you did that, then you would not be guilty of a larceny because you were acting under duress. Remember, the illegal act committed cannot be more harmful than the threatened act. So if somebody was threatening to damage your car if you didn't do something, you can't kill them because that's more harmful. All right, let's talk about age. It is generally conceded that children either lack the reasoning to form a mens rea or have only a partial ability to do so. Uh, mens rea being the guilty mind. So in most jurisdictions, children under the age of six cannot be charged with any crime, no matter what they do. And children under the ages of six to 18 can only be charged as juvenile delinquents, uh, which isn't technically a criminal conviction, and they generally have uh, sentences that are more reform-minded, although it could be incarceration if it's a serious crime. So the more lenient and more rehabilitation directed treatments. All right, mistakes of law and fact. A mistake of law defense asserts that the person was misled about the law, of the law, and therefore should not be held liable because either the law was never published or the person uh, was misled about the law by a official who is authorized to interpret the law. So let's talk about this now. Uh, first of all, the law was never published. Uh, you, in the newspapers, you'll see public notice sections where all sorts of legal notices are published. One thing that must be published are all new laws. So when the legislature passes a law and, and the governor or the president signs it, it must be published in a newspaper to make the public be aware of this. If it didn't, then technically you could uh, be found not guilty, although rarely are laws not published. Uh, another example would be that you were misled about the law. Let's say that the requirement for motor vehicle insurance is, uh, I'm just making this up, I don't know what it is, say it's uh, $30,000, right, liability. And motor vehicles mistakenly, due to a typo, prints 10000 so you go out and you only buy $10,000 worth of insurance, and then you get into an accident, the police find out you're underinsured, you get a summons. Uh, if you could show the pamphlet, you would not be guilty of underinsurance, uninsured motorists, because you were misled by an official publication. Likewise, if you were told on the phone by somebody charged with giving advice in that area, who's a government employee, you would also be not guilty. Okay, involuntary intoxication. The involuntary intoxication defense asserts that the person is not guilty of a crime due to intoxication unknowingly or forcibly induced upon them by another, 
or due to voluntarily taking a drug without being aware of its side effects when a reasonable person uh, would also uh, have been unaware. So let's talk about the first one, uh, unknowing intoxication. Uh, this actually happened to me when I was rather young. Uh, I was in a bar and we were drinking with some people and a guy I was with played a joke on me. Uh, he had the bartender, unbeknownst to me, fill my drink with like seven shots of rum. And then he said, hey, I'll bet you that we can't chug a lug our drinks. And I already had a couple of drinks, so I was not that clear minded. And I did that, which meant that I suddenly drank like seven drinks at once. And I had already had a few. Uh, and wow, did I become intoxicated unknowingly. Uh, and that would be an end out if I went and now if I, if I had had like one or two drinks and the person did that and I went out and got arrested for drunk driving, if I could prove that, uh, you know, I, I could probably get off, but it would pretty, be pretty hard to prove. By the way, that's extremely dangerous. Uh, chug a lugging large amounts of, of alcohol or beer or wine uh, can kill somebody uh, because the amount of alcohol is so great and it's so quickly absorbed into their system that uh, they actually become unconscious before their body's normal reaction, which is we've been poisoned with crap, throw it up, puke, can take effect. And then the person uh, absorbs all that alcohol into their nerve, into their blood, and they stop breathing and their heart stops. So never chug a lot large amounts of alcohol or let people do it. It is very dangerous. It's also involuntary intoxication if somebody forces you to do it, puts a gun to your head and say, drink all this stuff, and then you commit some crime. Uh, if you take medication and you were not aware of its like intoxicating side effects and you were driving a car, uh, if, if a reasonable person wouldn't have known, you can probably be found not guilty of, say, drunk driving. But usually they put enough warnings on prescription drug vials that it's pretty hard to claim you didn't know its intoxicating effect. All right, unconsciousness. The unconsciousness defense asserts that the mens rea, the evil uh, mind requirement for criminal liability was missing because the person was unconscious when the actus reus, the prohibited act, was committed. And this could be due to uh, injury, which caused unconsciousness. Uh, you were hit on the head while you were uh, doing construction work on the on a 30 story building. And as you were unconscious, you, you dropped your wrench, it fell off the building, hit and killed somebody. Well, when you release that wrench, you were unconscious. So Obviously, you didn't do it uh, with an evil mens rea. There's no crime. Uh, it could also be uh, during a seizure. If you're having a grand mal seizure and you're on the ground thrashing about and you strike somebody in the face and break their nose, uh, you had no way of knowing that. So uh, as a result, uh, there's no mens rea and, and you're not guilty of, of an assault. Um, another example would be sleepwalking. If uh, you were sleepwalking and committed some crime, uh, you also are not conscious then. Uh, although good luck trying to pr prove to a judge and jury that you were sleepwalking. Uh, provocation. The provocation defense asserts that the defendant was purposely provoked uh, into an emotional rage, which should either eliminate or reduce his or her criminal uh, liability. So these examples might be barroom provocations where you know, somebody says, oh, you know, I, I slept with your mother last night. She was really good. Uh, uh, or or um, another possibility is family violence after years of abuse. A, a woman who uh, on a regular basis is abused by her husband. And then at some point, uh, perhaps even uh, before he does another abuse act, uh, strikes out and, uh, and, and kills him or injures him. Uh, although that becomes a, a difficult defense because uh, if the husband was not actually attacking the woman at that point, it, it may be difficult to, to do the provocation. Certainly you can't do self-defense and provocation is also difficult to prove, but it, it could be a defense. Insanity. The insanity defense asserts that the defendant could not form a mens rea due to a mental disease or defect. And we're talking about serious mental illness, like schizophrenia, uh, not, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, neurosis where you're, you know, you're, you're a little paranoid about something. Now, insanity is usually an affirmative defense. And an affirmative defense is one where the burden of proof rests on the defendant. Uh, if you 
uh, if you say you didn't do it, you're innocent, or if you use um, another defense like uh, involuntary intoxication, ignorance of the law, right? Uh, well, I'm sorry, I make that I make it confuse them. Ordinary defense, an ordinary defense uh, is a situation where the you see you're not guilty. The state must prove that you're guilty. But if you claim uh, self-defense, that's an affirmative defense, and you have to prove that. Uh, that you meet the elements of uh, self-defense, and the same is case with uh, same is true with du duress defenses. Uh, so while many defenses are ordinary, and the state must prove you guilty, uh, for some defenses they're affirmative, and the burden of proof rests on you. And insanity, and and self-defense, and duress, uh, mistake of fact, involuntary intoxication, and a number of others are affirmative defenses. Now, the insanity defense is rarely raised because it's very difficult to prove. It's also controversial. People don't like it, so juries are reluctant to find people not guilty. And it also still results in the incarceration of a defendant, but in a mental hospital instead of a jail. And people committed to mental hospitals under this defense have to stay there until they're cured or... Uh, or they have to at least be deemed no longer a threat to society. So they stay there indefinitely until cured or deemed not dangerous to society. Uh, and that's why the insanity defense is generally only used for really serious crimes like murder. Because if it was a lesser crime like larceny or, or burglary or damaging property, uh, you know, you wouldn't spend that much time in jail. Uh, but if you are found insane, you could spend the rest of your life if if you're never made sane or you're, you're proved, uh, not deemed proved to be uh, safe to release. So insanity is not used that often. All right, so that's the end of lesson three, part three. And now you'll have to move on to lesson three, part four.